want to fend for myself, and I, I want to build people up for them to fend. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to a new edition of the Free Like Me podcast. I'm your host, Clark Fredericks. Guests come on, speak their truth, leave their burdens behind, and walk out the door free like me. If you're interested in uh, following me on social media, I'm on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. If you're interested in the Free Like Me coaching program, you want to uh, overcome your childhood trauma, reach out to me privately. We'll set up a consultation call and get you started. And this week, I am uh, honored to have Heidi Brown. She was a Facebook follower of mine reached out to me, told me her story of her childhood and the abuse she suffered. And I've heard pretty much every story imaginable. Heidi, Heidi's story is like, really took it to a, to a different level of the what she had to deal with. We're not going to go into everything, but we're going to cover enough uh, so you, the audience, can paint a picture for yourselves. But there's monsters amongst us. And they walk side by side with us and they weasel their way into our homes. And uh, that's what happened with Heidi. And we're going to cover it and hopefully this will free her and uh, start a new chapter in her life. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in and let's get started. Heidi, my dear, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, you uh, you followed me on Facebook uh, for a while and and knew my story and you know I I put out there every so often if you're interested in coming on the program reach out to me uh, privately and you did that and uh, I've heard a lot of stories of uh, horrific abuse um, some of the things you told me in private are, are just unbelievable it's uh, it's uh, some of the worst things I've heard. We're not going to cover all of that out of respect for your wishes. Um, what we are going to cover is is, is plenty, uh, plenty enough trauma for the audience to get a picture of what your life was like as a child. Uh, so I'm, I'm honored you're here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell me a little bit about where you grew up? Was it in New Jersey? What county? What town? It was New Jersey. Um, it was Landing, New Jersey. Went to Roxbury High School. And when you grew up, uh, what you know? What did you grow up in? Like the '60s as a child? Is that the is that the yes. time frame? '60s, yes. '70s. Yes. Okay. So we're we're probably similar. I, I I'll never ask a woman her age. But. <laughs> <laughs> I I was born in sixty four, so it's 64. not a, yeah. Okay, I was born in sixty five. Yeah, so yeah. we're basically the same generation. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right. Um, and people can't, you know, people now, younger people of this generation, they can't understand the freedom that was given to us back then. You know. It's, yeah, absolutely. You, you, there was no computers or cell phones. No. You were told to get out of the house, yeah. be gone, be back at dinner time. Right. You know, you had free reign at an early age to go do whatever. You know, like as soon as you could ride that bike, you were gone. Exactly. Out right? of there. So, yeah, yeah. Same with you, right? Yep. It's like everybody I talked to is like, that's how it was back then. Yeah. Um, were, did you have both parents in the picture? No, my mother and father divorced uh, when I was two. I don't even recall my father ever being in the picture. No. You know, no. Well, I mean, you know, visitation type of thing. But as far as the two of them being together, no, because I, I think they divorced when I was two. Two? Did you, as you got older, did you have any relationship with your uh, father? Oh, absolutely. Oh, you did? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Is he still alive now no. or your mother? Unfortunately, my father is no longer, and my mother passed in 15. So they're both 2015, gone. yeah. Okay. And your mother, after the divorce, she, you know, uh, got a new man? Correct. I assume? Yes. And uh, tell me, you know, who was this guy? What did he do for a living? Well, his name was Robert Dillon. Robert, uh, Robert Dillon. Robert Nelson Dillon, if you want to be technical. What he did for a living then, I don't know. I do recall um, he worked for Ford Motor Company uh, repoing cars. He was a repo man? Correct. 
I take it he became your abuser? That would be correct. Now, so your parents divorced when you're two. So so your mother gets a boyfriend fairly quickly. Uh, apparently. Yeah. And uh, did he move into the house? Yes. He did? Yes. And from, like, your earliest recollection, like, when does he start uh, abusing you or having having you do things to him? I was three. So right, pretty much right off the bat. Pretty much right off the bat. Wow. And can you speak about what what happened first? You know, your first interactions, um, molestation with him? My first uh, encounter with him was uh, we were on the couch. He put a blindfold around me and told me to uh, suck his thumb, which clearly was not his thumb. Right. And I believe I called him out on it, and then the blindfold wasn't necessary anymore. So, but that continued. I mean, it was a, a daily occurrence when, uh, you know, we were home. For you to give him oral. Correct. Starting at three. Correct. And, and just continuing on. Correct. Would he, did he use any threats against you? Like, did, to keep you quiet? Did, did your mother, was she, where was she like when this is going on? She must have been out with my sister. Um, because it was just the two of us in the home at the time, I recall. Um, uh, you know, there were times when those two would leave and they would lock my sister and I in a bedroom with a with a, a exterior lock, and they would just go. Go party? Well, don't know where they went, don't know what they did, and then, you know, we were in there for hours. And, uh, and what if you had to pee? Well, we did. And so we you... thought about climbing out the window because it wasn't a far drop. But in the meantime, we peed our pants and took our underwear and we shoved them under the bed. And then we got our asses beaten for it. For it? Yep. Did your mother and him do drugs? Would that be what? No. Nope. Did you ever see drug use? No. Nope. No drug use? None. Heavy drinking? Drinking, but no drug use. No drug use. No. Nope. So this guy isn't even like, uh, you know, like clouding his thinking with with drugs Correct. With what he's having you do to him. Correct. Like he's, he's just, yes. this is just who he is. He is a sick individual. So three years old, he starts off putting a blindfold on you to tell you to suck his thumb. And Correct. it's obviously not. And you call him out on it. So then he just does away with the blindfold and has you do this to him on a daily basis. Correct. You know. And you had told me that sometimes it would be at night while your mother was sleeping. It generally uh, was at night. Uh, would wake me up. Just come into your room, or would yes. he take you out of the room, or just no, come into come your into room? my room? And was your sister? Did you guys share a room, or she had her own room? When I was three, I can't recall don't rem that. Recall that um, we moved to that was White Meadow Lake. We moved to Morris Plains. I don't recall the living arrangements there either. I know it was a big, huge, and you know, old, old home. Victorian, you know, style home. And uh, my sister was at that point in first, no, kindergarten. And, um, you know, that was the first time he ever beat me up. So but, not only he's sexually molesting you, he's also getting physical with you, violent? Beat me to a pulp. And you're how old? Four. Four. And why is he beating you? Did you do something egregious? Couldn't tell you. Nope. He was kicking me on the floor. My hair was falling out. He was stepping on my hair, kicking me. And my mother had forgotten my sister's lunch and had to come back to the house. And now I'm on the floor crying and screaming because I'm a four-year-old child. And uh, he picked me up real quick and coddled me and said, oh, my God, she fell down the stairs. My mother bought it. Off she went. That was the end of that. That was that. She bought what she wanted to yeah, believe. Sure. She had blinders on. There's no doubt. I mean, if you're being forced to, to give a grown man oral every day, basically, from age three on, there had to be changes in your behavior, like signs or something. Did she, Well, one would she... think. I mean, f f for me to look back at children now and, you know— uh, we lied to Dyfus. 
Dyfus was at the house. Who called? How they got there? I have no idea. But this was, you know, when we were probably nine, ten. Uh, you know, they believed our lies. You you have to look through children. You can't they're because they're being threatened, and you cannot just take a child what they're saying, especially when there's an accusation like this. There's a, there was a reason Dyfus was at the house. Right. You don't know how they got called. No idea. Where does it go as you get? Each year, older and older. Where where does the molestation go? From you know, does he does he eventually do intercourse with you, whether vaginal, vaginal or anally? It was anal. He only liked anal. Correct. And what age did that start? Well, we moved into the landing home when I was seven, so that's when that started. Seven years old. Correct. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> it's, yeah. And I tell all my guests, you know, I, I got I to gotta let this nervous chuckle out so I don't. Yeah, ex- no, that's okay. Hey. So, so I don't <laughs> explode. But I, I hear all these horror stories and it just like, I just want to snap. But I, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So now how frequent are, you know, we anally raping you versus the uh, oral? Like, is it weekly? More times than I care to remember. I mean, was it monthly, uh, weekly? I don't think it was Whatever. weekly, but, you know, the oral sex, was that was daily. That was constant. Uh, constant. And uh, the only time we got a break uh, was when we went to my grandparents' house, and my mother pretty much got rid of us every single weekend. So from Friday... To Sunday, we weren't home. So we got a reprieve on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And then, you know, because we were always with my grandparents. And, that, you know, nobody, they didn't see anything in you or you didn't. Uh, and, and this isn't to, you know, this isn't, look, and I'm not trying to blame you in any way whatsoever. Nine out of 10 victims of child molestation keep quiet. Only one speaks up. Uh, did you ever think of speaking up or saying anything maybe to your grandparents or to a teacher or to your mother? Or My mother, we did tell. My sister and I finally had uh, enough. I don't know what age it was. It could have been 12, 11, 12 years old. We finally said something to her um, about what was going on, and it it was— we need him to keep this house. So you need to just pretty much suck it up, buttercup. Toe the line. Yeah. And, you know, that's what you're for, not us. And it, she didn't care. <laughs> uh, and I hear this time and time again where the mother yeah. just, like, puts the blinders on. You know, my very first guest, Michelle, you know, uh her and her mother walk in on her three-year-old sister giving the mother's boyfriend oral. And and the mother grabs Michelle by the hand and yanks her out of the room and slaps her and tells her to keep quiet. The mother walks in on Michelle getting raped at six and turns around and shuts the door so the guy can continue. And, and, and you know, it's just uh, and the same thing. Like, we got to keep a roof over our head. So you're going to sacrifice your daughters just to keep a roof over your head? Selfish. Yeah, it's un- it's unconscionable. Yes, it is. Oh, Heidi, I'm so yes, sorry. It it's I, it's just it's tough to like fathom that a mother would actually do that. I agree. Yeah, it's just incredible you're to supposed me. to protect your children. Yes, not not, not send like, them out with the wolves. I, I'm sorry, I got to yeah. feed you to the wolves so right. I can keep right. a roof over my head. Right, it's crazy. Yeah, um, and and you share with me that uh, this guy wasn't satisfied just having you alone. He would he would bring some friends sometimes over to the house. Correct, or we would go to their house. So he would take you and say, we're going for a drive or something? Yeah, whatever. I don't recall. Um, honestly, there's a lot. You know, people are like, oh, I remember high school. No. No, I don't. Right. There are just so many things with uh, so many blank pages. And I don't know whether it's because I chose to black them out or, um, but I've been through my therapy. I've 
seen my shrinks. I've, you know, so to live with, to accept it and know, I know it wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything at three years old to deserve it. Of course it. not. And then up to, you know, the point where I'm 16 years old now and now I have to fight for myself. And I did fight. You know, like I always wonder back then because there was no internet, you know, like, and I hear how these predators find other predators uh, somehow. Like, like, how do you, how do you go to your buddies you work with and be like, hey, do you, do you want an oral from a from a uh, seven year old girl? Um, you know, <laughs> my my girlfriend's daughter is available, and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I I don't know. Like, how does how does that segue into I that? I don't know. I don't know how you ask someone that. No, it's it's unfathomable. Well, like, perhaps that's who called Dyfus. I mean, I don't know. You know, maybe he asked the wrong person, and they were like, you know, are you, are you kidding? You know, who knows. Right. And do you, do you recall how many of his buddies you had to do this for? Two or three. Two or three other, yeah. other weirdos. Yep. yep. Like, and you were, and you were what age at this, like around seven? Seven, eight, nine, eight. ten. You know? I, I just would love to hear the conversation. <laughs> like one guy to another, like, hey, my uh, girlfriend's seven year old uh, gives me oral all the time. You, 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 wanna, yeah, you, you want, want in? Right. Like how? I don't know. <laughs> like I don't know. And the and the person doesn't say. Yeah, you're sick. You're, you're a freaking yeah, you're, dead man. Right, you know? right. Like he, the person says, "Yeah, I'm in." Yeah, that's crazy, I, I don't isn't it? it? Well, look at these people. I mean, if uh, you read the news every day, they're they're a dime a dozen. The school teachers, the guards, the your situation with the Cub Scouts. And, yeah. I mean, they're all over the place. Yeah. I mean, and they, they, they haven't right, gone away. They're right under our noses, and people can't recognize it. They don't recognize it, and that's the sad part. Yeah, I, 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 I'm just stuck on how they found each. Like, you know, like you know, if you find some weird chat room on the internet and be like, you know, like oral with seven year olds, you know, as the as the the headline, you know, I can see how you could find them. But how do you, how do you go, go to go to your buddies or your coworkers and be like, hey, you know, oral with a seven? I don't even know how he found those people. Yeah, it's insane. I, I don't. It's know. like bizarre. I don't know. I mean, sick. Yeah, it that like totally baffles me, and it's just like with all the priests too. Like there there would be like multiple priests doing the same behavior. Like how does one priest go to the other priest and be like? Are you into little boys too? <laughs> and the priest goes, "I most certainly am." Yeah, like it's it's crazy. I have no comment to me. on that end of it because I could go off on that. <laughs> it's like absolutely insane to me how they how they find each other back then. At least now I can somewhat understand it now, now on the internet. Right. But back then, I have no idea how they did it. They're just not vetting people enough, and then we complain and bitch about. Oh, you're in my personal life. Well, we have to be. When you're dealing with children and you're a coach or you're a mentor, you, you need to be vetted. Yeah, I, you really can't trust anyone. No. I mean, every story I hear. And I don't. Yeah, I you trust no one. You can't. It's uh... That's why I've been single for 11 years. I trust no one. Are you... Th I, I have I'm I have no no interest in learning about someone else and tr trying to trust them. I, it's just not going to happen anymore in my life. It's right. just not. To a degree, I'm glad you're stopping the cycle. I also want you to I would love for you to find somebody to be happy with, but w those of us who have been abused, horribly abused, who who grew up in dysfunction, grew up in chaos, we that's what we know, and we search that out throughout our life. And I, it's just like some people people come on here and they're like, you know, abused as a child, raped raped as a teenager, raped in their twenties, and and they're like, you know, I just don't know how it kept happening. And ha well, you only you only knew dysfunction, chaos, craziness. Uh, dysfunctional people, so you keep searching that out because that's the norm for you. I had one uh, 
female psychiatrist that I had gone to see. And um, she said, this is all you know. All right. And that was the only smart, intelligent thing I got out of any of the people I had gone to see. Of the therapy? Yes. And I thought, well, you're absolutely right. And I walked out and I said, thank you. All right. And that was it, because she was correct. This is all I know. Yeah. Dysfunction, crazy, abuse, verbal, physical. That's all I knew. Yeah. And, the, you know, women who've been raised like that and all the guys they bring into their life, it's it's usually, all you know, wrong. just you know, right. Wrong. Right. You know, either a drug addict, an alcoholic, they're abusive. They cheat they, because you're that's what you knew. Correct. That's what you know. And that's what you're used to. You you may hate it, but it's also what your body and your mind is used to. Correct. Ay, 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 ay. Um, and you know, and I and I started therapy can do wonders, but therapists get stuck just wanting to keep their finger in the past. And and that's why I started coaching because like, you know, th ther my therapist, you know, it's just like rehashing the past over and over and over and over and over. And then when you get a new therapist, you gotta start from scratch again. Pass, 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 pass. I want to go forward, you know. So coaching, coaching, like takes you forward. Therapy deals with the past to bring you up to where you're at. You know, it's just. But they get stuck in the past. Is that what you found? With, I agree. With therapy, I said, you know, you know, you're not listening to what I'm saying. You're not giving me any advice. You're giving me zero direction. So I have to move on. And I went through several of them. You know, I would go to different people. And like I said, the last one I was to, that's what she said to me. And, and that was the main thing you took from her I and said like, thanks? Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. That is exactly right. So how does little Heidi, like, hope, you know, like, you, you, from three years old on, you're, you're, you're being sexually abused uh, uh, you're being anally raped at seven on a, a somewhat regular basis. Uh, you're forced to to give oral to other guys. And how are you coping at that age? Do you can you recall like how you? I mean, were you a horrible student? Like, no, could you, I was could an you not concentrate? I was an excellent. Student. You were able to dive into your homework. Yeah. That was, I couldn't wait to get out of the house, go to school. So I might as well just, you know, exceed. And then as the, you know, high school uh, years started settling in, then you, your eyes are wider open to what your surroundings are and what's going on and that this isn't right. This is not normal because my friends don't talk about this. Uh, you know, they're loving families. They sit down, they have dinner in the meantime. You know, my sister and I are going home. We have chores to do before our homework, which is change sheets, get dinner going, vacuuming and cleaning and doing everything my mother should have been doing. But we had to do that. And then you do your schoolwork. So so you guys are treated like Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella, who also has to be a prostitute, basically, you know, to yeah. their mother's boyfriend's sure. needs. Yes. It's it's a it's a crappy way to grow up. Didn't want to go home after school, but I knew no one was there. So, you know, okay, but then, you know, as the time everybody comes home and, and it's like a oh shit, here we go again. Right. Did you get into drugs and alcohol at an early age to cope? Um, no drugs. No drugs. Uh no. Wow. No. Um I mean usually what you what you grew up in was the gateway for like here I am, an addict in the waiting. Come get me, you know? I knew I had a very addictive personality, so I was afraid, literally afraid. Um, I think I've tried cocaine twice. It did nothing for me either time. Right. So I was very happy about that because, again, I knew I had an addictive personality. Um, the pot smoking, still do that. And do I drink? Yes, I do drink. Okay. But other than that, and like I had said to you in the first interview, um, I – you know, did a hit of mescaline, uh, it, probably in high school at some point, and I realized that laughing was fun. 
because I didn't laugh. I never laughed. I always had a puss on. Right. If you saw my grade school photographs, this was oh, the face. Right. It was, yeah. there was no smile. There was no, you know, I'm happy to move on to the next grade. It was a puss. Right. And my grandparents remembered seeing the puss and saying, you, well, you got to smile. You, you have smile to. more. Yeah. Well, why? I had nothing to smile about. Right. But that, when I took that head mask and started laughing for, you know, 12 hours, it was freaking <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is great. This I, is what it feels like to laugh. Yeah. And, and this is laugh. fun. So not that I continued to do that because I didn't, but I continue to now I have to work on myself going, this was fun and I need to make things that make me laugh, laugh. not go the other way. You know, I'll use, I'll use that as an analogy. Uh, you don't laugh in prison. Like guys are not, guys are not sitting around chuckling and slapping their knee and, you know, laughing it up. There is zero laughter in prison. So you basically were in a prison growing up. Yes. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have to say so. And you had sadistic guards. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, that's, that's, a, yeah. it's a great equation. Very well you know? put. Yes. Yeah. Like, very well put. There is no laughter in prison. And yep. uh, for you to never laugh until you had to do uh, something that made you trip. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. Like, wow. Which was the truth. And yeah. uh, I, I'll never forget it. I was like, this was great. <laughs> And, I, and I'm just, I'm sort of shocked that, I mean, I'm not shocked that you loved going to school. I'm shocked that you were able to, like, put all the garbage out to concentrate enough to, to be a good student. You know, normally your grades fail. You don't do sports. You isolate, you know. Uh, did sports. I played soccer. I played volleyball. You were um, able to do all that stuff. Did it all. Well, played basketball, too, but my uh, my mother would never bring us to any of these. You know, you these parents today, they're, they're all they're doing is running their children from one sport to right. the next. And we were like, oh, because we were tall in high school. And uh, my sister's 5'11", so she was, you know, she's got a couple inches on me. And we wanted to play basketball. Nope. You got to find your own way there and find your own way back. You Not wanna, doing it. If you want to do it, it's it. on you. Yeah. Wow. You mentioned that at some point uh, you and your sister went to your mother. Correct. So, you know, I don't want to out your sister, but I, the same thing was happening to her that was happening to you? Not as much. Uh, and I don't know about the anal. I don't think so. But something, you know, some sort of molestation. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, you started at three and you mentioned like 12, 13. It's still going on. Uh, when did it stop? You know, that's a, that's close to a 10 year run already. It was a 13 year run. Uh, it stopped the day that I moved out of the house. Uh, it was the day after my 16th birthday because I was sick in bed on my 16th birthday I went um, into Roxbury High School. I got on the bus that next day and went into school, and I quit school, and uh, I moved in with my friend's parents. So you quit school at 16? Correct. Did you need your mother's permission? I was 16. I didn't need her so permission, that's when but I had to wait. Till you're 16. Correct. If school was your safe haven, why did you quit that safe haven? Can you recall what you were thinking back then? I needed a job. I needed uh, to save money for a car because I'm 16 now and I have to. You wanted to get out. I got to get under, out. Out from underneath that. I have to get so out. I have to work and start I, making money so I can be on my own. Correct. So so he's he's continuing oral and anal through your teen years. I don't think it was into my teen years, the anal. Uh, that was a probably a five year span, because he knew I wouldn't put up with it. Because now I'm fighting, I'm fighting back, and I'm turning the tables on him. He he was not a stupid man, and so I did try to learn 
uh, again, they say keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I kept them close to me so that I would have more ammo and know what that sick, twisted brain was all about and nail him in other ways. Um, so, but after the, you know, when I was 16, there was no more of that. I put him through a wall. He started something. Um, I put him through a wall in the hallway because now I'm fighting for my life. I have no choice. Right. And I got to get out of here, but I had to wait till I was 16. And, and what did your mother say when you said, I'm moving out and I'm quitting school or, or did... she didn't give a shit. Are you kidding me? Get out of here. Yeah. She didn't care. You're... My sister left the year before. She did. Yeah. She, cause she got pregnant. So she, and that was her way out. And where did she go when she got pregnant to the, to, to the boyfriends? Uh, yeah, I think she moved in with my father for a little while, but up where the boyfriend was. And then they, you know, got married after the baby was born. And that was short-lived. Right. You know, it was just a way out. So then you're so you're alone in the house for like a year or so. I, yes, I was. <laughs> and then you're like, this is... Uh, I gotta go. I can't deal with this anymore. Yeah, but I had nowhere to go. Right. So, and did you tell your friends' parents like why you had to get out of your house, like or what? Can you, you recall know what? That? I do not recall. Right. I don't recall why. I know that my friend got me a job. We worked in a factory in Fairfield, and we would go there every day. We'd work ten hours a day, and then have, think I have a half a day on a Friday off, and it was good money. I was saving money. I was, you know, and then was able to buy a car and, you know, and I moved to Virginia at 17 and uh, that just wasn't for me. So I came back and... Uh, and what did you do when you got back? Rented a room from the pedophile. <laughs> Excuse me, what was that? I rented a room from him. Was he still with your mother? No. They Long had, gone. They had split? Yes. So, like, you moving out of the house, he's like, why should I stick around then? Yeah, but he bought the house from my mother. So he buys the house from your mother. Correct. Where does your mom go? She moved in with her boyfriend uh, in a house in Opakong that they bought. So she moves one the next town over. Correct. After... after and he buys the house. So now what is your mindset coming back and moving in with the guy who abused you? Keep him close. You had to assume that he would try still try to get with you. Well, I didn't I didn't assume that because he had a girlfriend and you know, um I had a nice lock on my door. So I could come and go as I pleased. Uh, I needed to, to, again, save money. Rent wasn't too much. It was one room. And I would go to work, come back. And did he try anything ever? He did. He did. And then of that course. was the end of that. And that's... And how did you How did you prevent him from... Like, what did he... Did he Tried to rape you or yes, force you? Yes, he tried to... to rape me, yes, at that point. Um, and no, it was fighting. I have had no choice but to fight him off, and I did. And then that was the end of that shit. So after, I mean, why, did he kick you out after that? After he tried... I, No, I left. Oh, you left after he tried Absolutely. to rape you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, to me, I mean, people hearing this might be like pulling their hair out, be like, why? Why would she go rent a room from the guy who, you know, was anally raping her? Like, why, why, why? Me knowing like everything I've heard from from people, like, you know, just, uh, I mean, you could, you like, we're 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 in a spell for a while, um, and as we said with your therapist, we know dysfunction and we keep doing dysfunction. 
So, I mean. I'm not proud of it. No, no. But it like it, you're just repeating what you knew. Like you knew you knew chaos and dysfunction from this guy. And and it was it was the norm. Yep. So, like you went back to what you knew. Yes, unfortunately. Yeah. And had I, you know, recognized that because I was probably only 18, 19 years old when I did that. So, you know, is there a, a, a rhyme or reason other than the room was available and needed a place to sleep? And I didn't, I thought, it, you know, the shenanigans were over with. But again, I wanted to keep him close, keep an eye on him. Um, I just needed to get inside of his brain. Do you know or do you assume uh, that he, you know, had other victims after you? Well, there were victims during us when we were children because... Oh, so you and your sister weren't the only ones he was messing with? Apparently not. Um, a couple of our friends. Um, and that's what Elaine Stewart made clear, that there were other people. It wasn't just us. But we weren't on the list. I believe that there was five when she had said. Now you just threw out a name, Elaine Stewart. Who's Elaine Detective Stewart? Detective Elaine Stewart was from the Morris County Sex Crimes Division, who I reached out to 25 years ago. And uh, when my sister was finally on board with me and uh, we were supposed to meet uh, Elaine Stewart, uh, Detective Elaine Stewart, in the Denville Police Department to go over this because she did say, she did return a phone call from mine, and she did say that um, there was uh, more victims, and this would certainly make a case. But every time we had an appointment set up for her, she would not show up or she would just uh, call and cancel, saying that she had bigger fish to fry, basically. Um as opposed to getting a pedophile off the streets who has a history of, uh, obviously, you know, years and years of child abuse. Right. And did you ever end up meeting with her? No. No, never met with her? Nope. Meet so, with any other detectives? No. She either swept it under the rug or said it wasn't important. And at that point, I lost uh, a lot of faith in the system. And, and so you were in your 30s when you decided to reach out to her? Correct. And what, what like, transpired at that age that you, you wanted to f reach out? I don't know. Or was it your getting your sister on board was the hard part? Getting my sister on board was very difficult because now at this point she has, um, you know, two more children who 25 years ago— were small children. Right. And she just didn't want... Trying to overturn the apple cart. Yeah, she and, didn't... And, yeah, and have the kids involved or have the kids find out. Right. You know, she just didn't want that. And I respected that because her kids are the love of my life. But um, I still needed her to be on board, and she agreed. And uh, But after... There was no meeting ever. After several attempts and nothing. And uh, nothing. It was pretty much like, uh, screw it. It's like you get abused yeah. all over again. Yeah. It was a kick in the face. Yeah, I'm sure that's how it yeah. felt. Yeah. You know, it, I'm sure as a child you had to feel like you were discarded, damaged goods. And then now here as an adult, you want to try to make things right. And you get discarded like your damaged goods again from a detective. Pretty much. Yeah, and it's just, uh, I'm sure it had to, like, bring up all those old feelings. Well, it, it was a feeling of disbelief on, uh, again, in the system. Um, but what was I going to do? Right. You know, uh, get the attention by killing him? You know, I don't look good in orange. <laughs> 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 you know, every... I. You know, every victim that I, you know, interview has 
that dream of you know their their abuser getting killed whether it's by their own hands or having somebody kill them for them you know and so you know is that is that something you fantasized about for a long time absolutely yeah but he also knew i was after him i mean in um that he should watch i mean i would take newspapers and you know how serial killers do it they cut up all these letters and they tape them onto a piece of paper I did all that, mailed him at least once a month, you know, just to keep him on his toes and that he should sleep with one eye open like I had to do most of my life. Right. So now it's your turn because I'm not going away. Unfortunately, he died before I could finish because it, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, there was an option of me hiring somebody else to kill him so that I wouldn't have blood on my hands, so to speak. Right. And then he he ended up dying? Yeah. How did he die? Could care, I don't know and could care less. Just hope it was painful. Yeah, because mine would have been. Right. When you moved back up from Virginia, uh, did you have any contact with your mother? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she, yeah. She stayed within our lives. My sister, you know, and my mother were like, you know. So your sister was closer to her. Oh, absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Even when you guys went to her and she said, we have to keep a roof over her head, you guys just do what you got to do. But I think he informed, my mother informed him to leave my sister alone. Just just take the one and leave the yeah, other one. Yeah, yeah. That was nice of mom. Yeah. And is your mother still alive? No. 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 And did you have any type of relationship towards the end of her life? Uh, well, she knew, um, you know, in talking and in passing, I, I will never take care of you. So you better look to the sister. I will never take care of you. And then when I took my father in, because my dad uh, had a, it's called Korsakoff syndrome, and it's along the lines of dementia. Okay. Um, uh, it's due to alcohol. And um, I took him in, and my mother was just shocked. I mean, just beside herself that I could take my father in. Why? He didn't do anything to me. <laughs> you know, right. he didn't do anything. I loved my father. So took him in, and he took 10 years off my life and two and a half, but... Did he? Did you ever share with your dad what had happened? Um, my my dad found out how I don't know, but my dad found out. Um, but then we were estranged. Uh, my sister and myself were estranged due to uh, my father's then wife uh, because she wanted nothing to do with us. So he agreed, and so for about five years we were estranged until we. Heard from other family members that he wasn't doing well, so my sister and I stepped up, and that's when we realized he was, you know. And the wife had left him? Uh, she died. Oh, she died? Yeah, she died. And then, so you end up taking care of your biological father. Correct. Right. Correct. And what what age is everybody dying at? Like, what age did your father die? Like, he how was, old? He was 72. Two, I believe. How about your mom? She was also 72. And how about the the pedophile? Don't know. Don't know. 60s or whatever. Uh, oh, no, he was older than that. Oh, he was in his yeah. 70s? I would, I would have to say maybe 80s. Really? M 80, yeah. Was he, he older than your mother? Yes. Oh, But okay. by, ha I, by how much, I don't recall. So after you moved back up and, and you... Uh, from Virginia, like, where does your life go? You know, like, what do you, what do you do with yourself? You know, <sighs> I got a job and then I obviously kept working. I, and then at 22, uh, I bought a house. You're able to buy a house at 22. My grandmother gave us a gift of $10,000 each. And I said, well, I'm going to buy a house cause I'm tired of moving and, you know, um, I always had a dog, my German Shepherds. I always had a Shepherd, so I bought a house so nobody could throw us out of anywhere. Awesome. And kept it for 35 years. 
Oh, great. So, wow. so 22, you get your own house. Um, after having such a horrible, <laughs> just upbringing, you're able to, uh, you know, you moved out at 16, so you could be on your own. And at, <laughs> at 22, that came to fruition. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. Great job. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Through your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, are you getting involved with men that are with the same type of dysfunction as you grew up in? No. Um, I liked funny people because I liked, of course, to laugh now at this point in my life. Right. And, uh, but did you ever get married? Twice. Twice. Okay. Uh, the first one didn't last very long. He lost the wedding ring on the on the honeymoon and got home, and I got out of the shower. He was on the phone with his ex-girlfriend. I'm like, what? What? So that was short-lived. And then, um, then I married another one, and he was like the love of my life. And uh, he was a pathological liar. <laughs> Go figure. Right. I mean, we had the great time, ta- greatest time together. I mean, never argue. We never, but oh, really, it's just every single thing that came out of his mouth was, was made a up. Can lie. It was a lie. Everything. Other, I'm just like, are those your real parents? I mean, it was. It was bad. It was to that point. It where was you bad. And, and plus, he robbed me blind. Every credit card um, that would come in the mail, you know, you have a you know, $25,000 cash advance or you have a $15,000, he would go and take it all. So before I know it, I am buried in debt. And then he's slapping my feet going, I want a divorce and gets up and walks out the door one day and that was ended that shit. But now, little did I know, he buried me financially and I had to file for bankruptcy. Uh. So what that therapist said later on about, you know, <laughs> we only know uh, what we grew up in. Yeah. It, it's following you. It, yeah. It followed you. Yep. Ugh. And then after after him, you're like. Well, uh, no, I had a, a, a no, the night, oof, that, that was a worse situation. <laughs> was with a guy for about 16 years. And again, it was the just the tumultuous you know crazy life right crazy life and not you know we still speak i will always love him he'll always be he's done he did a lot for me in my home and everything and then the le- final boyfriend i had one of my private detectives run him i'm like i this is how much i don't trust anybody run him you know, and then he got pissed off because I told him I ran his whole life. And but he, other than just being a jerk off, uh, he had nothing. You know, he didn't had nothing to hide. Right. <laughs> but I don't want to do that to somebody. Right. I want to run you. Right. But I guess Google does everything now for you, so well, I wouldn't have to if, pay if somebody. Somebody runs me; they'll find <laughs> they'll find out. You know. <laughs> Oh, man. So it did carry over in relationships, you know. Yes. Dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. Correct. Over and over and over. Correct. And uh, and then thus why the last 11 years you've just stayed to yourself. Exactly. To break that exactly. cycle. Exactly. Well, I don't know if I'm going to break it. I, I let's, One would hope so. Right. But uh, <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> So you sold your house after how many years did you have it? 35. 35. So you sold it when you're in your 50s. Yeah, uh, yeah, 59, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. and then uh oh, so you just sold it recently. 2 years. 2 years ago. Yes. Okay. And and did you buy another house you're renting now or No, I I I rent a room from my friend. Okay. And do you have do you have peace when you wake up and when you go to bed or are you are you are you calm? Can you experience joy? Can you laugh now and smile? Oh, I can do all of those you things. Can. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I never carried this with me. Um, did certain situations, certain smells, certain 
you know, of course it brings back, you know, a flashback. Right. Uh, do I have uh, monkey mind in the middle of the night where I can't go to sleep once in a while? Right. Um, but laugh, never a problem. Joy, never a problem. And I think my buddy can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> you brought a friend with you today, yeah, and you can... two laugh a lot. Oh my God, it's crazy. What what age did you start therapy for the first time? Uh, I mean, and why? Um, can you recall? I I I was afraid to have kids because I always heard that. You do your, you do to your children what has been done to you, right? And that was the last thing I wanted to do, and I knew I would never do that. But that's what society said you were going to do. So, Scared the hell out of you. So, so yeah, I uh, so it was probably in my twenties, middle mid twenties that you did therapy for the first time. Yeah. Or perhaps earlier than that, and then I just stopped for a while. But I, there were, you know, issues I had to work out, and I needed to hear what she said. This is all you know, because it really made a lot of sense. Did you ever end up having kids? No, never. Had couldn't children. have any children. No, okay. unfortunately, no. Right. Yeah, you know, I've never had kids either. Um, you know, it's just maybe you're just afraid of of bringing them into the world and the same horror happening to them that you uh, you experience. You know, um, you know that always plays. In the hopefully, the life. signs would have been recognized, and you know, right. You know, it seems like that era. You know, the '60s, '70s. Uh, it just it. Just, yeah, you know, I know. I know the pedophiles are are everywhere now, but it just seems like they were so prevalent back then. Like, um, just think, so many of them. I think they still are. Yeah, it's you, just uh, read <sighs> the news, and it's horrible. Yeah, it really is. And the people that are are in authority. You know, I what did I just read the other day? It was some school teacher from Wharton. Had all these. Uh, it was just last week. Um, he was a, uh, in a, he's a, a taught Italian, I believe, in a school down the line, but he lived in Wharton and he had all these child, child images. Uh, what is going for your brain to look at that? Right. I'll never understand that. Yeah. I mean, up by, up by me, uh, you know, parochial school, Pope John, um, and, uh, Last year, you know, in the paper about a teacher, you know, all the upskirt photos he had of the I, students. I know exactly who he is. Yeah, you do. Know, yeah, it's crazy. Like, they're still there. And I know. They, and they have to put themselves in in jobs or positions where they have access to kids. That's so what like, I'm saying. The vetting they're, process it needs to be stepped up a little bit. You, you, you would think, like, because uh, it's it's With, finally talked about now. Like, when we grew up, it the thought of talking about this. You was, couldn't. Oh. Just be quiet. Don't say anything. Don't keep your mouth shut. Kids are meant to be seen, not, not heard. Not heard. Oh, that's, that was my mother's favorite line. Right. It was all of the parents back then. It was her favorite line. You did three separate therapies, three different therapists. Oh, probably more than that. More than that over oh, yeah. the years? Yeah. And do you feel they helped at all? No. No, you didn't really get anything? No. I'd give them a couple shots. You know, all right, I didn't like it today, but I'll give you another shot. Go back next week. And I thought to myself, when I left most of them, you're a moron. I... I I don't know where your brain is going with this, but you're not listening to me or you're trying to psychoanalyze me, but you're not listening to me. Right. They're so just, it was, They're just start trying to go by the textbook they read. Ah, uh, yes. And I wasn't, and nobody's textbook. No one is. Every, everybody's situation is different. 
how many people in your circle have you opened up to about your past? I mean, have you talked openly about it or um, is this just something new that you've decided at this age, I'm not going to keep this crap inside? No, no. There are people in my circle that know about it. Um, Not from my younger years. Um, More so from, I'd have to say the last 15 years that because it's everywhere and, and people have opinions on what they're seeing. And then when there's a conversation and I don't like what they're saying, then I put my two cents in. And then it's pretty obvious, you know, where I was right. uh, uh, as a victim. Did you did you tell any classmates back in the day, like the girl you moved in with at 16? Did you confide with her? I honestly don't know if I did or not. I don't think I did. Your high school years are sort of a blur. Yes, very much. Yeah, I mean, you know, I say that, you know, like, I know I had happy times, but I just can't grasp any of them. You know, like, I'm sure I I had birthdays every year. You know, like, I know I had a birthday at 11 and 12. Can I recall that birthday? And can I recall my friends being over and us laughing and stuff? Absolutely not. But I can recall getting raped at 12. I can recall uh, having oral performed on me at 11, but I can't recall other details from my life back then. Probably the good ones. Right. Like, (laughs) and and that's what you feel like cheated. Like, you know, like those memories uh, have just faded away and like the trauma like stays in the forefront. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't think I told anyone um, my, and if I did, I never went into detail. It was, I don't, I know that, um, the one guy that lived next door to me, um, he knew a little something about it because I believe during a, a rape event, he was banging on the side of the house to stop it. Um, he could hear your screams. I or guess. Cries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the hand was always over the mouth, so you couldn't scream too loud. Your abuser would put his hand over your mouth. Yes. Right. But, I, mean, I mean, it's just, it infuriates me. It, 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 it baffles me. It's just, uh, uh, I, I don't, you know, like, you're going to, you're going to, cover the mouth of a seven-year-old while you're anally raping them because they're screaming too loud. And, yeah. And you're... And then what's your problem? Why are you crying? Oh, I don't know. Right. Ay, 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 ay. Yeah, so and, it was... And, and, and then, like, and then to know that your mother knew, you went to her, and she's like, you got to suck it up there, honey. We got to keep a roof over our house. It's just like, come on, bro. Like, come on, mom. Yep. Step up to the friggin' plate, will you? We, we wouldn't. We, you couldn't say anything because she'd just backhand you, and you know you could never say a thing. Don't Get back ever. In. Don't you know? So we were seen and not heard. Trust me. Right. I mean, that's the same exact thing that happened to uh, Michelle. Like, you know, like the mother would just slap her. Like, shut your mouth. I don't. I don't want to hear about it. You know, and that was, so your mother was a slapper too. Oh, she was a slapper, screamer, just you know, it was just, it, it was insane. The only happiness we had was when we went to my grandparents, grandparents. on the weekends. Right. You know, my mother's mother was a, and my grandfather, my mother's father, wonderful people. I mean, it was always, yeah, but I mean, what seven year old wants to go there on a Friday night and knit? <laughs> we don't want to knit but that's what we did <laughs> it's either knitting or or giving yeah, blowjobs yeah, so yeah i'll take, I'll the, take knitting. the knitting <laughs> yeah, yeah i'll take right. the knitting pearl one uh whatever the hell it is <laughs> um but you know they would take us camping and you know so we had fun with them i mean they were right wonderful people and then on saturday morning my other grandmother um would pick us up and then she she was younger than my other, my mom's mom. So we would, she would take us everywhere. Amusement parks and slides and water parks and down the shore for a week. And I mean, she made our lives just 
worth living for. Right back then. Yeah. Right. Um, amongst all the terror and horror, you, you you had some levity. Yes. Right. Well, that's good. Yes. Um, what would you say to to the audience? Uh, you know, like if there's somebody out there being abused or or who's gone through this and they're older like we are now, uh, you know, do you have any words of wisdom for them? My theory to a lot of things in life is if you can do nothing about it, then move on. If you can change it, then change it. But it, once you spill that glass of milk, it's over. What are you worried about? You, there's, you can't change it. Right. So accept the fact and move on. You don't want to put it in a closet and, you know, have a bunch of padlocks on the closet. Just accept the fact that you can do nothing about that milk that is spilled. It's over. Right. So if you can change it, change it. If not, yeah, move, move on. Move on. Don't just stay staring at the glass of milk that's spilled. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Thank you for being here, Heidi. I appreciate you uh, sharing your story. Thank you for having me. All right. Good luck on the rest of your life. Pleasure to meet you. Bye. Thank you. There you go, everybody. Another edition of the Free Like Me podcast. You can carve out a life for yourself after experiencing uh, the worst that uh, one human can do to another. Life does not have to be over. You don't have to... uh, uh, you know, you don't have to uh, take your own life. You don't have to have a life of addictions. You can, uh, you can overcome and you can flourish in life. So don't give up. See you next week. Bye.